Welcome to Dear Prudence. I'm your Prudence, Janae Desmond Harris. Today, we'll be talking about crushes that are complicated by power dynamics, family secrets around racial identity, and whether loud talking is a cultural issue that could end a relationship. Here to help me out is my friend, Gene Demby. He has been writing, reporting, tweeting, talking, and everything about race and identity for 15 years. He's the co-host of NPR's Code Switch podcast, which is really good. And I know I say everyone who comes on is really good, but that's why I chose them. Like, I actually believe that everyone who came on is really good. Um, Don't take my word for it. It actually was Apple's first ever podcast of the year. And I just want to share a fun fact. And you can bring this up if you think he gives bad advice. You can throw this back in his face. As a teenager, he was a youth activist on the abstinence-only speaking circuit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so funny because, first of all, why you bring up old shit? But it's like, it's like whenever mm-hmm. we play, like, two truths and a lie, that's always the truth that leaves people, like, messed up. Like, they're like, wait, what? Like, that's, that's, they're like, that's clearly a lie. No, it's not It's almost lie. worth living through to get to talk about <laughs> I know, exactly it, right. Know? Like, I got to, like, spread some disinformation, but, you know, it made a good cocktail story, like, 15 years later. Ah. It's funny because I've known that about you for a long time, but I've never asked you for, like, your talking points <laughs> or what your speech was. But we won't. We oh don't have to do that now. We don't have to do it right now. <laughs> oh, man. It's, it's embarrassing. And also, it's a fun little card to pull out. I mean, apologies to everyone who, like, we <laughs> gave this information about condoms to. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, sorry for the people who didn't get condoms. <laughs> I'm sure the speech was riveting. Oh, riveting. It started off, my name's Gene, and my name's Andrew, and we love sex. And then we talked oh about it. Oh, my God. <laughs> it, gets, it really started off like that's that? That's literally the first line. Yeah, yeah. And then it was like, but we won't ever do it. <laughs> but then it was like, but only in the context of. Oh, loving marriage. Yeah, exactly. Okay. That's okay. what God wants for it us. It sounds like it was well written. Um, <laughs> so with all your um, interesting background, all your experience on race, abstinence, other topics, <laughs> I was wondering if you could just start off giving one piece of unsolicited advice on anything at all. So I was thinking about this. Like, I was like, do I say something like really big and bold or like pretentious? But honestly, like, you know, like just keep it like on, like on a personal level, like ambiguity, y'all, is, is not good. It's, it, leave hmm. that shit for literary fiction. Uh, let your friends know you love them. Let your people know you love them. Um, let your your partners know like how you feel. How like don't assume that you know how they feel. Like over communicate, over communicate, over communicate. It's like the thing that I feel like so many things would be so much less frictionless. Like in the way we move through the world and our relationships, if we just like over talked. It's really hard to do. I'm saying that as somebody who struggles with it. But it's like, yeah, that's the thing I would say. I really like that. And, you know, so many times I'm answering these letters and I'm like, maybe you should have a conversation. Exactly. <laughs> Did you like, do they know that you feel this way? Do they know that you yeah. have this whole narrative about them in the, in your head? It's hard because I, I, I've actually gotten better myself about saying things since mm-hmm. I've started giving people that advice all the time, but it does not come naturally. Mm-hmm. I think it's natural to let ambiguity just be there because saying things can be hard. There's someone in our, in our orbit, my wife and I's orbit, who is like often talking about, you know, her dating life. And is always like, do you know this? Like, do you know this to be true? This, like, or are you just like, are you making this up? Like, you're assuming intention from these people. You know what I'm saying? You're assuming, mm-hmm. like, and it's just like a thing that everyone's lives would be so much easier if we just like, just, just be expl- like, let's make these things explicit. Let's make them. Let's not leave them as subtext or whatever. Anyway, don't need to infer. You can just ask a question. But you know, we're journalists, so you know, it's easier for us. Exactly. But everyone, everyone can take that advice. Mm-hmm. Well, with that, Gene and I will dive into your questions after a short break. Can't get enough Dear Prudence? Then you should definitely join Slate Plus, Slate's membership program. You'll get to hear me answer an extra question every week just for members. With your subscription, you get ad-free listening across the Slate network and unlimited reading on the Slate site, including all Dear Prudence columns, past and present. Go to slate.com forward slash Prudy Plus to sign up. It's just $15 for your first three months. Again, that's slate.com forward slash prudy plus. This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Let's face it, sometimes multitasking can be overwhelming. Like when your favorite podcast is playing and the person next to you is talking and your car fan is blasting, all while you're trying to find the perfect parking spot. But then again, sometimes multitasking is easy, like quoting with Progressive Insurance. They do the hard work of comparing rates so you can find a great rate that works for you, even if it's not with them. Give their nifty comparison tool a try, and you might just find getting the rate and coverage you deserve is easy. 
All you need to do is visit Progressive's website to get a quote with all the coverage you want, like comprehensive and collision coverage or personal injury protection. Then you'll see Progressive's direct rate, and their tool will provide options from other companies, all lined up and ready to compare, so it's simple to choose the rate and coverages you like. Press play on comparing auto rates. Quote at Progressive.com to join the over 29 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Comparison rates not available in all states or situations. Prices vary based on how you buy. Welcome back. You're listening to Dear Prudence, and I'm here with Jean Demby. We're going to get started with our first letter, which is titled Secret Keeper. My sister is raising her sons with lies. She had a fraught relationship with her ex until my oldest nephew was three. In court, it came out that he was not the biological father of either boy, but he ended up dying soon after. The boys have no real memory of him, but that doesn't stop their mother from filling their heads with fairy tales. My biggest concern is it is becoming very obvious my oldest nephew is mixed race. People are constantly commenting on it, especially since my sister and her ex are very fair. My sister claims it is our Indian heritage showing up. This is a complete fabrication. The few times I have expressed concern, my sister told me to mind my own business, and she knows what is best for her sons. I can't see this ending well for anyone. Between DNA tests being so common and her dead ex's family living nearby, it isn't going to stay a secret. I have always heard that keeping family secrets like closed adoptions are very damaging, especially the older they get. My nephew is already seven and starting to ask questions. What should I do here? Mm. So just to like define terms, I guess, or to set the tone for how we're going to talk about this, whenever someone doesn't mention a race, it's white. Literally, oh my God, it's literally the first thing I wrote. I was like, the way yeah. you can tell this letter writer is a white person is there's no, they never explicate their own race. That's the, that's right. the first thing I wrote here. Like, mm. The sister the, and the letter writer and the ex were all just plain. Yes, they were exactly. Regular. Mm-hmm. They're regular people. Mm-hmm. Um, and whenever someone says mixed race, nine times out of 10, you know that's black, That right? means black, yes, exactly. So we're not talking about a child who is half white and half Asian. <laughs> exactly, right, right, right. So I'm actually surprised that the kid is asking questions at seven mm-hmm. because I I don't know. I go through the world thinking maybe this was just me being a gullible child. <laughs> the kids just believe whatever you tell them, you know? <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but I think that's backed up by reality. Like, do you remember the documentary Little White Lie? Yes. Mm-hmm. This was about a woman who, in fact, had like a white mother and a black father who was raised to believe that she was just Jewish um, and a little darker than everyone because of like some Italian something going on. I think to the naked eye, to if you were to interview a hundred people on the street, everyone would have said she was black. Mm -hmm. So this wasn't a biracial person who was um, a Mariah Carey or like maybe even a Maya Rudolph Mm -hmm. where there's some question. This was like a Barack Obama. (laughs) Um, So it was clear, but I think she was in pretty much in college before she started to even ask questions. So just a note, it doesn't mean anything. I'm just surprised the kid is asking questions at seven years old. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is like, I'm required by code switch tradition to bring up this study from the Public Religion Research Institute. Um, It came out a little while ago, but they found that white people had the most racially isolated social networks. Like 75% of white people have no black friends. And so, mm. like, if this child is mixed race with black ancestry, which which is what you and I are assuming, <laughs> that's like, a very good statistical chance that they're not, like, a ton of black people who are coming into their orbit by default, right? right. Um, and so there's this question here um, about the letter writer's obligations, like, and what they, what they are to this, this poor nephew, um, you know, to make sure that he doesn't internalize all the default skepticisms and reticence about black folks that white people have, right? You know what I'm saying? Right. Um, which is separate from the question of like whether the letter writer should like blow up the mother spot. The answer right. to that question is pretty clearly no, right? Like this clearly, Definitely. yeah, right, right. So I mean, I think I think as the aunt, absolutely. Like, let's just be clear to answer the question asked. You cannot go like take your take your nephew to lunch to share with him that his mother wasn't faithful <laughs> to his father. Also, his father is black, and then drop him back in this household where I think it's safe to say maybe being black has like a certain level of stigma or shame associated mm-hmm. with it right mm-hmm. so this isn't like a celebratory thing to learn mm-hmm. um and side note i do feel for the mom as a mother now i have like a new appreciation for how hard it would be to be a single mother mm-hmm. that's tough with one kid definitely tough with multiple kids on top of that her spouse died that's tough on top of that it's her fault but she's carrying this huge secret 
Mm-hmm. So she's dealing with a lot. And I just wonder whether she would even be equipped to like create a framework for this kid to help manage this news about A, your father's not who you think he is. Mm-hmm. B, you're black. C, I've been lying to you. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't think she has what it takes. Yeah. I mean, even the fact that she's like perpetuating the lie that tough, mm-hmm. like that a, that a father that frankly, like not to be all like grim and morbid, but morbid about it, but a father to this who died when these children were really young, these children probably will have very few memories of, right? Right. Um, but, like, they're being told that this is their father, right? Um, which is the thing that, like, you actually don't even need to take that tack at all, right? Like, she never needed to to do That's that. So true. You know, like, uh, because it's not like they have a ton of memories that are still being made with this man, right? Like, mm-hmm. this is, like, sort of underlines the, the point you just made. Like, it's probably some, like, something about Blackness that irradiates, <laughs> you know what I mean? That fact, yeah. right? you know what I mean? Like, the fact that they... That's the thing she needs to keep from him or them, right? Like, is, ugh, right. And so she's probably not the kind of person who is going to be, like, ready to to really be like, hey, let's have some real conversations. Of, well, seven years old, so how real can you be? But, like, like age-appropriate conversations about right. their parentage. Like, but I do think there's a way that is less fraught than the way it's happening, right? Mm-hmm. So this question just hit me. It's actually really hard and I don't know my answer to it, but I think it's a great one. <laughs> um, <laughs> if you were the child here, what would you want to happen to you? Oh my God. So hmm, so the hard part about this is like, I'm a black person who loves black people. So like, mm-hmm. I would want to know that I was, you know what I mean? Like, um, it's something we like, that comes across our, like comes into our field of vision a lot on the show is like, people of color um, broadly who have been really isolated from other people of color and yeah. then in adulthood have to figure out how to build community with people who they like grew up being skeptical of or being distant from. Mm-hmm. Um, and also people who have like tools and humor and all sorts of things that they can use to navigate, you know, mm-hmm. racism and white, and white supremacy. Right. You know what I mean? Like, um, I feel for this child, like, knowing what I know as an adult, right? Like, I was like, oh, I would love to have access to all the tools that, you know, that people create in community with each other to, like, right. to just get through the world, like, to live in the world and, like, the things that people make together. And, like, oh, I feel bad. This like, it seems like just the knowledge that, hey, by the way, you're Black. You don't know the person who made you Black. You don't know probably any other Black people. Mm-hmm. Like, just have that fact with nothing else is, like, the absolute worst of both worlds, right? Yeah, it's, it's, that seems horrible. Yeah, that would be really, right. really bad. Yeah. Because you have, like, the knowledge of Blackness as it's seen through a white lens. Mm-hmm. But you have, like, none of the connections, none of the community, mm-hmm. none of the upside of it. And mm-hmm. so you're just sitting there in your family, and then there's this layer of shame on top of it. Oh, my God. Could you imagine? I can't, actually. And I almost want... I think everyone should step back as I'm thinking through this and maybe just let the kid find out on his own time. Mm. Like I hear that he's asking questions and I don't know what those questions are. Um, Maybe like, why is my hair curly? Mm -hmm. Why do I have a tan? Whatever. Mm -hmm. But unless he's specifically asking like, is my father who you say my father was? Mm Because I think I have African American ancestry. (laughs) I almost think, Oh, okay. I'm thinking through this live. I wonder if she can try to get him into some environments around other black people so that he can have like a safety net when he does find out. The aunt, you mean? Or yeah. The, yeah. Or mm-hmm. can the aunt push the mom to do that? You know, mm-hmm. I know you're not ready to tell. I know that this is too much to share right now. I know you want to like keep the fairy tale going, but we both know that he's going to find out. Why don't we find like some mentors, a big brother, <laughs> a basketball team, a camp, I don't after school program. I know this isn't even like geographically reasonable or For sure. attainable in some places. Mm-hmm. But do you trust the letter writer to be the kind of person who can like discern obviously because the, the letter writers are always in a place with also in a place where they don't even know how to they, they don't even realize they should probably explicate their whiteness, right? Like do right. you trust them to be the kind of person to be like, I should be able, I should be the person choosing and cultivating the black spaces you get to be in. Right. Like, absolutely. Right. Like she would be like, so yes, you are black and you don't have to be an athlete or a rapper. You can be positive. <laughs> you can be positive. Right. You can exactly. be different from mm-hmm. all the other black people. Yeah. I can see that happening. Um, uh, so letter writer. Okay. So maybe letter writer, you, um, I think you as the aunt should get prepared for sure. to be a soft place to land or like a source of context or a source of direction or a source of something other than like white is normal and right and mm-hmm. black is weird and secret and shameful. 
when this information does come out, whenever it naturally comes out, which I'm going to guess age 14. Right. I think that's probably when it's going to become a thing that's going to be harder to to like to keep denying. Right. Um, Mm -hmm. Because at some point, other people want to force the issue. You know what I mean? Like, Mm -hmm. again, you know how residential segregation works is a good chance that this kid goes to like a white school. You know what I mean? That it's going to be a harder thing to maintain. And like, obviously, um, their mom is not thinking about it, you know, what it's going to look like six or seven years hence. But that's right. a, there's a reckoning coming, you know what I mean? And so. Right. Um, and it's so interesting that she's so comfortable saying our family has Indian ancestry mm-hmm. and not our family has black ancestry, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, there's so many ways in which like this letter is like, it's the whitest letter. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, uh, I just, I was fascinated by the way it was written. Just like, mm, mm. white people give away their sort of presumptions about race all the time. And they don't realize they do it. And this letter is like a sort of perfect example of the way that shows up. Right. Um, right. Because we're not hearing, you know, I think he deserves to know about this culture mm-hmm. and it would be great for him to find out. And there's a lot of opportunities there. Mm-hmm. We're reading, it isn't going to stay a secret as if, it would be nice if it could stay a secret. I know, and don't exactly. get me wrong, like I understand it's all tangled up with like the infidelity and sure. finding out your father was something else. So it's more complicated than just. But we don't even know that it's infidelity, right? Like, I mean, one of the things that's happening in this letter is this the letter writer is making a lot of assumptions about the circumstances mm-hmm. in which the child was conceived. Like maybe maybe they maybe they were taking a break. Maybe they were you know what I mean? Like they said she the letter writer says they had a you know a tricky relationship, right? Like who knows right. what was happening, right? Maybe the deceased father one it's like okay these are not i know these aren't my children or now that i know but it doesn't mean i'm not gonna like raise them oh as my own God. Like, that's so true there's, there's a million things that could have could happen i mean i, I mean i'm being incredibly gracious here but like like who knows what is happening right and so i don't know like that there's a lot of assumptions about um there's a lot of assumptions i think the letter writer is also making about the context in which like these child these these uh this at least the one child was conceived in you know what I mean? Right. And do you know who's totally left out of the letter? The kid's dad. Yeah, exactly. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like the kid has a dad and a whole family who I'm guessing would not find it scandalous or horrible mm-hmm. that he's half white and mm-hmm. would like love to know him. Mm-hmm. So that's another thing to consider. Um, again, I know letter writer, it's not your choice when to tell. But um, I think I would say like at the moment, you should focus on being there for your sister for the benefit of your nephew. Your sister's going through it, right? She's stressed out. She's concealing lies and secrets she's like been through trauma she's probably having a hard time being a great mom if you want to help your nephew help your sister whether that's like practical or emotional support and then think about how you can be a voice for the idea that being black is not like a shameful horrible thing when it does inevitably come out i'm just imagining Um, the letter writer like showing up like Oh, just I'm just making some black eyed peas. Pay me no mind. Like, you know what I mean? Just like right. go to like, oh, what's this? Why this is this is Jay Z? Perhaps you know what I mean? Just like I just like just imagining like. Oh. Do you guys want to come to my house for Kwanzaa? <laughs> exactly <Nice> like celebration. <laughs> Aunt Bridget. <laughs> 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 anyway, this is tough. Um, but whatever you do, do not tell the secret yourself. That's not going to help. Yeah, anyone. that's not. That's way out of bounds. That's way out of bounds. This is Dear Prudence. We need to take a break, but when we come back, more letters from you and advice from us. Stay tuned. Reese's peanut butter cups are the greatest, but let me play devil's advocate here. Let's see. So, no, that's a good thing. Uh, (laughs) That's definitely not a problem. Uh, Reese's, you did it. You stumped this charming devil. What does it mean to be Black in America? In NPR's Black Stories, Black Truths, a collection of stories as varied, nuanced, and dynamic as Black experiences, you'll hear, it means everything. Search NPR Black Stories, Black Truths wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to Dear Prudence. I'm here with my guest, Jean, to answer your letters. And the next one is titled, Vocal and Vexed. I've been seeing a really great guy, Jack, for the last six months. He's smart, funny, kind, and I especially admire how compassionate and empathetic he is. However, there's one big issue that we can't seem to get past. 
I grew up in a large, loving Jewish family where it wasn't unusual to have a loud debate with relatives from across a crowded table. And as the youngest girl, I often had to yell to get a word in edgewise over my older siblings and parents, not to mention the grandparents and aunts who were at our house 24-7. To be clear, I don't run around screaming my head off, but I can speak loudly if I'm being talked over, feeling excited, or getting upset about something. I also have ADHD which means that I have a hard time noticing how loud I can get when I'm speaking about something I'm passionate about. However, Jack was an only child whose parents were unhappily married, and he describes them as, quote, emotionally stunted wasps, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, who had nightly screaming matches throughout his childhood and later tried to manipulate him during their very bitter divorce. He now has a hard time with loud voices and anything he considers yelling, which is not just actual shouting, it includes speaking in a frustrated tone loudly. It makes him completely shut down. That means that whenever we disagree over something and I talk too loudly, he just shuts down and walks away. He refuses to discuss it with me any further because I, quote, couldn't control myself. For example, he wants us to hang out with his two best friends and their girlfriends, who have also been best friends since college. I feel very left out and uncomfortable when we all hang out. And when he kept saying that I just needed to get to know them better, I got exasperated and teary. I said, why can't you understand that I feel lonely and excluded and don't want to keep doing this? And I said it loudly because I was on the brink of tears that he wouldn't listen. His response was to go stone-faced and leave the room and then refuse to talk about it for days. I feel like he's punishing me for something I have a really hard time controlling. And no matter how hard I try, it triggers him to hear me get excited or upset or frustrated. Even if I'm venting about a hard day at work or something that's not about him and trying to control my volume, I still set him off. I don't know if this is something we can get past. Is it possible to overcome this? If so, how? Woo! <laughs> Oh, this one! Oh, this this one hits so close to home in so many ways. So Does it many know ways. Me? Wait, are you oh a loud person? No, uh, I'm not not a loud person, but my wife's family they are loud. Really? People. Yeah, and so I actually, funnily enough, I just spent like the last three weeks um, with them in the Bay. Uh, my mm-hmm. wife is from this very large, very loud Indian family, um, and so their normal speaking voice is like. Like, it sounds like a shouting match. It sounds like, you know what really? I mean? Like, you know what I mean? It sounds like, oh, is a rap battle going on? What's going on? Like, oh. It's like, yo, it's like they're just loud people. Um, and that was like one of the things that my wife and I had to like learn to navigate, right? It's like her default setting is like, she's like a really extroverted person. Her family's like full of just, you know, um, just really, really vociferous people. And also, like, I would sort of be like, yo, y'all, y'all doing too much. And also, mm-hmm. the other thing is like, that is like kind of related to, but it's separate from the fact that like, and this is something I learned recently, was that uh, thanks therapy. Um, <laughs> that a lot of uh, heterosexual relationships uh, between mm-hmm. men and women. Um, there's the this classic conflict avoidant person and the person who's like the person who uh, does the does the sort of poking. Mm-hmm. Um, and so a lot of dudes um, like like the and that was me. I was the one who was always retreating. Like, oh, you're doing too much right now. I'm gonna fall back. And that's mm-hmm. like a it's just you end up in this weird pattern cycle, right? Of like. You're not listening to me. It's like, I'm not going to listen to you if you yell at me. You know what I'm saying? That right. kind of thing becomes just like like the cycle you can't pull yourself out of. Um, it's just a very, I feel like very, it, it was heartening to know that other couples, other heterosexual couples have the same dynamic at play. And also really, I felt real basic because <laughs> I was like, oh shit, we just like, <laughs> we just the rest of these people, we're doing the same things. Um, so yeah, like I just. everyone else. But yeah, exactly. I think it's the right to point out that there are like, there are two distinct parts of this. Mm-hmm. The volume. And the fact that they have only been dating six months and don't like each other. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so the volume, um, that was interesting for me. I think I probably fall on the lower volume side of things, too. And mm-hmm. I would also be a bit on edge if people were just shouting around me all the time. I'm definitely, sure. like, definitely noise sensitive. For me, um, the thing that drives me nuts is, like, two sources of noise at the same time. So someone talking loud and the TV would kind of kill me. Um, Mm -hmm. Just someone talking loud, I could probably do okay with, but there usually is background noise. Um, Right, exactly. Total, like, small point. What is the difference between talking loud and a frustrated voice and yelling? I feel like those are the same thing. That is the same thing, right? But also, it's one of those things, like, and you said this in in one of your recent uh, answers, which I really appreciate it, was like, 
if your partner says something to you and you have to repeat back what they said, it's mm-hmm. actually much harder to t- say the thing that they said to you without, you know, putting a little totally. embellishment on it, a little mustard on like what, like, you know, and, and like filtering it through what you heard, what you think mm-hmm. they said. Like a lot of times when people in relationships are arguing, I think they're underestimating the extent to like which the thing they're saying is not being received for mm-hmm. all sorts of reason. You know what I'm saying? And so like, and then the way they don't realize it sometimes she, she might not realize that she's yelling at this cat. You know what I'm saying? Like, right. Um, but it's also true that like, it sounds like he has some real trauma around, you know, being yelled at, right? Like, mm-hmm. and that's like a, you know, couples therapy is is rough and also really helpful. Like, I mean, you said these people don't like each other, and I'm not, I'm not so pessimistic about it. But like, you have to learn. Like, chemistry is easy. Compatibility is a whole different thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. And like, like you got to learn how to like get through that part of it. You know what I mean? But like, let me let me point you back to the first line in the letter. <laughs> I have been seeing a really great guy, Jack, for six months. Yeah, that's a lot. This is too early. It's too this soon. is not her husband, right? Yeah, yeah and right, for so sure. In this six months, um, they've had repeated incidents of her raising her voice and call it frustrated, you know, talking, call it yelling, mm-hmm. call it what you will. But like getting so frustrated that she's speaking to him in a loud tone and him shutting down. I don't feel like that should have happened too many times in the first six months. Definitely yeah. not enough for it to be a pattern. Yeah, that should be big, like honeymooning right now, right? That should be right. like in a very like dreamy eyes and you know what I mean? Right. I'm a big advocate for the idea that you need to start off really, really high in terms mm-hmm. of like compatibility, attraction. Like, I don't think those things really, really build. You can tinker with compatibility around the edges, mm-hmm. right? But the general, like, do we pretty often want the same thing and get along and, you know... Um, make each other happy. Another thing that jumped out to me, again, separate from the volume, she doesn't want to hang out with his friends. So he's trying to integrate her into his life um, Mm. with his friends and their girlfriends. And one of their fights is about her not wanting to go because she feels left out. So Mm. to me... Wait, she does. She doesn't want to go because she feels left out. Right, because she feels. <laughs> which I mean, what are you trying to do? So yeah, it's the hope is... to isolate him forever, so you never have to be around anyone who knows him better than you know him. Oh um, my god, I'm feeling self conscious because someone emailed me and was like, "Why are you always telling the letter writers they're wrong?" You're all... <laughs> <laughs> and I realized, they are. I realized they were kind of right. So um, you're not horrible. Like you're not. You're not. You're not completely on the wrong side of things here, but I think what I'm seeing, this hit me as a letter about um, a dating experiment that is not going well, that Mm -hmm. has been presented as a letter about volume and culture. Yes. And it's not that complicated. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's that complicated. I think if you were saying, you know, we've been together two years and we have this great relationship. I feel so supported. Um, We generally see eye to eye. I've never been happier. We have like discussions about hard issues, but it's not a big deal. However, when he's watching football, he yells. Mm-hmm. Or when I'm when I'm watching football, I yell and it disturbs him. That would be one thing. But like the the voice raising is happening because you're fighting all the time. Right. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> because y'all beefing all the time. Like yeah. to your point, they don't. They maybe don't like each other. Hmm. I don't know. Right. Like. But you were about to send them to couples therapy to go work this out and move I forward. Mean, <laughs> I just like it's one of those things where like. It's complicated, right? Like, again, extending grace to them. Like, one of the things I love about my wife is that she's loud, right? Like, mm-hmm. when we first started dating, back when we both were, like, giant football fans, like, one of the things I love was, like, I was the kind of person who yelled at the screen, right? Like, get the... F-, you know what I mean? And she was, too. I and remember I like, you saying that about her. It was about <laughs> it was like, basketball, but still. Yeah, exactly. I love the fact that she was, like, a yeller. Like, she, like, was just, like... like It's, like, one of the things I love about her. It's, like, it's, like the t- to, your, to the point about ambiguity early. Like, <laughs> there's not a lot of ambiguity in my wife. Like, she's, like, yeah, mm-hmm. I know how she feels. Um... And, um, but also like, it, you know, this, just because you like, it, I, I'm just imagining that this is a cat who might really like this about his, his, what are they even, I mean, like six months, I guess their girlfriend, yeah. girlfriend right? They probably, I guess, yeah, I guess, I guess, um, he might really like that about her. And also like when it comes up in fights, it might also activate all this stuff. Um, I think there's a, Wait, can we like, do a, s- a side note, um, about your wife. It's interesting yeah, sure. to me to hear about how loud she is because, that absolutely does not connect in any way to being like aggressive or hostile. For sure, right? a thousand percent. That's so my exactly relationship right. with her is a texting relationship, mm-hmm. and she's like very sweet. She's very thoughtful. Mm-hmm. Oh, she's yeah, very she's, gentle. She's and loud like, and sweet. Yeah, when it comes to like her <laughs> ideas and her words. So mm-hmm. I mean, it would be tough for her 
if someone felt like upset or scared by her volume when Mm -hmm. she knows and I know that she's coming from like the most gentle and sensitive possible place (laughs) when she interacts (laughs) with the world, you know, but But she might not sound like it. But if you're a partner with her, right, and she's like, I feel like, and she's raising her voice, it's not, it's going (laughs) to like, it's, you know, she's not coming from the most sensitive, sweet place when she's saying it. And Mm -hmm. also like, it's one of those things that happens in like, and I don't know if this is true for you and Joel, but like when you'll argue, um, and it's something we had to like learn, uh, like to work around, or it's like, both of us felt really entitled to the way we responded to like, or the way we sort of, to the our styles of argument, arguing, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? So like, um, I felt like I can't talk to you if you want to talk to me that way. If you want to like, you know what I'm saying? Like, and she was like, well, this is how I talk. This is how I talk. You know, I cry sometimes when I get upset. Right. Like, um, and it's like, there's a way to, like, sometimes you have to create, this is going to sound really corny. I'm so sorry to advance. It's going to sometimes have to create like a, a language inside this thing you're building together, right? That's mm-hmm. like not, you know, like sometimes you just have to stretch a little bit. Like, all right, you're yelling at me. I'm not going to take it personal. Like, you're yelling, not at me, but you're yelling when you're talking to me. And mm-hmm. I'm not going to, I'm not going to make that about me and, you know, you, me feeling attacked, right? And all the yeah. reasons that I might feel attacked. And I'm pulling away and maybe I should not, I should fight the urge to, you know what I mean? I think it would be easier to take that point of view if she was saying things like, oh my God, I'm so excited to go out tonight. Or even like, hey, Mm -hmm. can we, um, can we go get sushi instead of Mexican food? Instead of, why can't you understand that I feel lonely and excluded and don't want to hang out with your friends? Like, but... (laughs) And this is like the kind of stuff that's always funny. Like in, in couples therapy, you would hear this out loud. You're like, so wait, you feel lonely and excluded and so you don't want to hang out with his friends? Like, that's right. what are you doing? Like, it's, like doesn't make any sense. You should go so you don't feel left out. Like, what are you doing? Right. You like in I mean? this case, I think like her tone, her unreasonable tone, I think she's feeling a way that backs up the yelling. And I think yes. there's a, I think there are some conflicts in their relationship that match up with yelling. Um, and just something to look at. I'm not saying go ahead and end it. I'm not allowed to tell people to break up every single letter. So I'm not going to do that. Um, <laughs> but I do think that sometimes people can get caught up on issues that feel like less personal um, or less potentially relationship ending, For like sure. vo- volume and culture rather than digging under them and saying like, Mm. do we want, do we enjoy our life together and do we want the same thing? So just think about it. Mm -hmm. That's really fair. That's really fair. Okay. And you know, couples therapy never hurts because worst case scenario, you got some therapy for yourself. Mm -hmm. A thousand percent. You're listening to the Dear Prudence show. And when we come back, we'll be reading more of your letters. Stay with us. I'm Janae, and you're listening to Dear Prudence. Jean and I are about to tackle our last question for the day. Ready, Jean? Yes, let's do it. Let's do it. Okay. This letter is titled, In Love But Unsettled. Recently, I've developed a significant crush on a friend of mine. We enjoy each other's company, we have similar interests, and we have great chemistry. I would love to ask them on a date, but I'm uncertain about a few factors, and I think I need an outside perspective. I've asked a few friends, but I've gotten conflicting responses. Our financial situations are very different. I won't need to get a job until after I graduate, and my parents are paying for my education. They are attending school and working full-time. At the beginning of the year, before I knew them very well... I started paying them to tutor me in math, and I don't want to stop. They're a great teacher, they're great at math, and they can explain wonderfully. Plus, I love their company, and we often talk about books, video games, history, and everything else under the sun. I worry that if I ask them on the date, it might cause a weird power dynamic. I obviously wouldn't hold my financial privilege over them, but I also think that if we have a non-amicable breakup, it might be difficult for these tutoring sessions to continue. Finally, there's a significant age gap. I'm 22 and they're 19. They're socially and academically advanced. Honestly, I think they're more mature than most people my age, let alone theirs. We're taking similar classes and have similar friends, so I wouldn't really be worrying about this if it wasn't for everything else. What is the correct course here? Am I overthinking? And it's perfectly fine. They're the smartest and most interesting person I've ever met. Talking with them is generally the highlight of my day. I really want to make this work, but I also don't want to take advantage of them or put them in an uncomfortable position. 
So it's just funny doing an advice column and podcasts because you get on the one hand people who have really strong views about how they get to treat other people and how the world should be like, you know, I don't understand why my wife thinks she needs her own debit card and should be allowed to leave the house without me. (laughs) And aren't I right? And then you get people who want to do something that's pretty much 100% okay. And -hmm. they're just like driving themselves nuts over it and Mm -hmm. hand wringing and self-flagellating and I think I see in your eyes that you agree this is the latter situation. I think it's, yeah, I think you're, I, I, I thought this person, oh, this is very sweet. And you're, they're also doing too much, mm-hmm. right? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that, it, it feels like it's it's really dope, actually, that they're thinking about sort of the age disparities and like, um, and the financial disparities, which actually is kind of resting on a very flimsy premise here, right? Mm-hmm. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know how much we should make out of the fact that they have to work in college, right? You know what I mean? Like, right how big a deal that is, right? Um, it seems at least from the letter writer to stand in for like some, as an avatar for like some giant economic chasm between the two of them, which I don't know if that's actually true. You know what I mean? Um, I like the, the phrase very sweet, but doing too much. I could like <laughs> just abbreviate that, like VSDTM. That would be my answer to so many people. <laughs> that's totally, I mean, I like, I love our wonderful and thoughtful and progressive slate readers, but we do get a lot of VSDTM letters. Um, So let's just break it down into pieces. So three-year age difference. That's nothing, right? I I struggle with age gaps because I sit here and I start thinking, well, what what about six years? What about nine years? What about 12 years? Where exactly is the line? I never know, but I don't think three years is a big deal at all, right? At that age, though, 19 and 22 are like a pretty big jump. Uh, okay, you so, know what that, I mean? uh, so maybe like a few points for power dynamic being a legitimate in sure. there. Okay, um, even though same group of friends, right? Yes, exactly. Right, exactly. So same group of friends yeah. suggest that like they're moving in the same circles. It's not like this person is. Yeah, exactly. Right. So it's not a seventeen-year-old high school student mm-hmm. and a college student who's a handful of years older, which would be weird. But also right. like the age of consent would factor in there. Anyway, financial situations are different. Um, okay, like you said, I think they might be making that a little bit overblown. Also, never in my life have I heard that brought up as like part of power dynamics that a wealthy person can't date a poor person. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And again, we're assuming a lot about this person's, like this person is poor, right? And it's just not like, maybe that's pocket money. Like, I mean, like, I I mean, they talk about a lot of stuff, but, but like, who knows? Like, all right, maybe... You know how it is in college? Like, everybody is sort of like... One of the weird things about college, if you, when you go away to college, is like, uh, class stuff is both like, it's present and also like, you're all living in the same shitty dorms, you know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? And so like, some of it gets flattened in a lot of ways and it shows up right. in weird spaces. And so like, you know, I don't know, maybe just want some, I don't know, he wants some J's, you know what I mean? It's like, all right, I need $20 for some J's, I'm gonna get, you know, whatever it is, right? Like, or some video games. He's a video, you know, they said they like video games. Right. That's something expensive. Like, who who, who knows? Like, I want to buy some my own shit without my parents knowing, right? Without like having to get there okay. Like who knows right. what those things are, right? This is I mean, not so, wanting to date the person like who you serve food to at the food bank. Exactly, right. It's, it's exactly. not like that at all. Um mm-hmm. so the tutoring arrangement, um okay, yes, the tutoring arrangement could fall apart if you break up and if you do date, if you break up and if the breakup doesn't go well. Um you know what you could do? I would say give them a great review, help them find another client or if you're so comfortable Keep paying them through the end of the year. Make Mm -hmm. it so that's not like something that's hanging over their head, making them feel like they have to keep dating you. That's great. I just don't think would happen. Um, But it seems like (laughs) money is not an issue. So just say, okay, this is the speech when you want to ask them out. I want to talk to you about something. Um, It's a little awkward and I don't want to change the great friendship and tutoring relationship we have. If it's a no, we can pretend this conversation never happened. And just so you know, regardless, like I'm going to pay my tutoring bill through the end of the semester. Um, I feel like we have such good conversations. You're one of the most interesting people I've met. Could I take you out sometime? Oh, wow! I got you. <laughs> I'm really you. You missed all the opportunities to spit some like some, <laughs> some like some some math. You know what I'm saying? Some math game. In there. <laughs> I mean, you've been teaching to me about. <laughs> I can barely add. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> teaching on adding stuff. You know what I mean? Why was me when I was, this was it? What is that? Uh, that old joke from the MTV show? I know my calculus, and I know that you plus me equals us, <laughs> or something like that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, you gotta sprinkle good. some of that. In. <laughs> free game, yo. Free game on the Dear Pretty podcast. Do you know what I really think is going on here? 
What do you think? I think the letter writer has this huge crush. And actually, the word love was used in the sign-off. So it's really intense feelings. Um, Mm. It feels overwhelming. They're really nervous about asking this person out. And it's easier to say, um, do I have power due to financial privilege than it is to say, could I get rejected and hurt? Exactly. Yes. A thousand percent. Oh, my, Janae, that's your soul on point there. That's exactly. That's exactly. No, I, I didn't even think about that before, but you're absolutely right. This is exactly what's happening right Right. this person is like i need to i need to create a reason to not do this thing that makes me really scared right Mm -hmm. um and that's a great one like and also it's a kind of like self-aggrandizing one like look at how thoughtful i I mean not that again i think this person is very sweet and doing too much but also one other read to this point is like this is a read that allows me to be really munificent look how Mm -hmm. gracious i am right and the fact that i'm I can be I can be like everyone else and be scared to ask someone else Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and be scared to ask someone out and like struggle with my confidence. But I can frame it as being super, super sensitive and thoughtful Mm -hmm. and like really well-meaning. How much do tutors cost? in this day and age that like it's like oh if I if we stop dating this person's gonna meet financial ruin like you know what I'm saying like you know, like that seems that you're not, seems you're, you're not their boss at you know <laughs> Fortune 500 company like exactly in the nicest way possible calm down yeah I mean like oh and relax you know what I mean yes and so I think you need to um go ahead and ask them out and just to check the box like give all the disclaimers I shared with you make sure they know that you're not going to like retaliate or ruin their life in any way. Um, and just emphasize how much you really like them. Like you have here, it sounds like a lovely, delightful connection that I hope goes somewhere Rooting for you. Okay. Those are all the questions we have for this week. It's been fun and hopefully helpful. Thank you, Jean. This was so much fun. I'm so happy you enjoyed yourself and very good advice. Listen and subscribe to Jean's podcast, NPR's Code Switch, where he and his co-host, B.A. Parker and Lori Lizarraga, explore how race affects every part of society, from politics and pop culture to history, food, and everything in between. New episodes are available every Wednesday. Do you need help getting along with partners, relatives, coworkers, and people in general? Write to me. Go to slate.com forward slash prudy. That's slate.com forward slash P R U D I E. The Dear Prudence column publishes every Thursday. If you'd like to hear your question answered on the podcast, we're looking for letter writers who will be comfortable recording their questions for the show. You can stay anonymous. Dear Prudence is produced by Sierra Spragley Ricks with a special thanks to Maura Curry. Editorial help from Paola de Verona. Daisy Rosario is Senior Supervising Producer, and Alicia Montgomery is Slate's VP of Audio. I'm your Prudence, Janae desmond Harris. Until next time. Are you tired of hiding your smile? Maybe it's time to get some help from G4 by Goldpaw. Their talented technicians specialize in creating brand new permanent teeth in just 24 hours with as few as four titanium implants. You can enjoy a fully customized bridge for your upper and or lower set of teeth. You can have peace of mind knowing that the G4's experienced lab technicians have designed more than 15,000 new smiles. You can have a new smile that looks, feels, and functions just like natural teeth. Patients from all over the world travel to G4 to get their permanent smiles in just 24 hours and change their lives forever. Booking an appointment has never been easier. Simply visit yourteeth.com today and schedule your appointment with G4 by Golpa. Mention this podcast when you book to save $1,000. So what are you waiting for? Get ready to show off your new confident smile with G4 by Golpa. Visit yourteeth.com today and start your journey to a new permanent smile in just 24 hours. G4 by Golpa. Powered by technology. Inspired by patience.